Ever wondered why the US Navy always uses engines by this one company? When Navy SEALs punch through surf at midnight, they're not trusting their lives and secret operations to marina outboards. Here's the mind-blowing truth. These engines can be thrown from a transom, sink to the ocean floor, and fire up within five minutes. But while you're paying premium for the latest four-stroke technology, the Navy deliberately chooses dinosaur two-strokes that violate EPA regulations. The twist? This backwards approach might be genius, and the small Florida company behind it has quietly become the backbone of America's maritime special operations. Let me paint you a picture of how we got here. For decades, if you were a marine raider or combat swimmer operating a combat rubber raiding craft in hostile waters, chances are you were running an Evinrude. The Wisconsin-based company had military contracts stretching back to World War II, when their four-cylinder engines literally carried troops across the Rhine. But the crown jewel of their military line was something special, the Evinrude 55 MFE. Now, the 55 MFE wasn't just any outboard. This bad boy could run on gasoline, jet fuel, kerosene, and in a pinch, even diesel fuel. Some old-timers in the team swear they've seen guys dump whiskey in the tank when things got desperate, though I wouldn't recommend trying that with your bass boat. The engine was painted matte tactical black, weighed about 250 pounds, and featured something called E-Tech technology that gave it bulletproof operation in conditions that would destroy regular engines. Here's the kicker, though. In 2020, BRP, Evinrude's parent company, shocked everyone by completely exiting the outboard market. Military contracts and all. After more than a century of operation, they just stopped. Suddenly, the Department of Defense found itself needing a new supplier for one of its most critical pieces of equipment. Enter Raider Outboards, a family operation run out of a nondescript building in Titusville, Florida, just spitting distance from where SpaceX launches rockets. George Woodruff and his son Chris had been tinkering with military contracts since 2009, and when Nevin Rood bowed out, they were ready to step up. Hey, if you're finding this fascinating, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Trust me, what comes next about how these engines can survive being launched from a submarine is absolutely wild. Raider outboards operate on a philosophy that would make Silicon Valley engineers cry. Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. While Mercury, Yamaha, and other manufacturers are cramming their engines with computer chips, electronic fuel injection, and digital throttle controls, Raider is deliberately building what they lovingly call dinosaurs. Their flagship products, the Raider 40 and Raider 50, are heavily modified versions of basic Tohatsu two-stroke engines. Yeah, you heard that right. Carburetted two-strokes with pull starters. The same technology your grandpa used to cruise the lake in 1975. But here's why the Pentagon loves them. When you're inserted behind enemy lines via submarine, and your engine gets completely flooded with salt water, the last thing you want is a fried computer module. These power plants feature a patented dewatering system developed by the Navy itself. Picture this, a team of frogmen launches from a submerged submarine through a torpedo tube. Yes, the engine is specifically designed to fit through a 30-inch submarine hatch. The boat and motor are completely flooded. Within five minutes, five minutes, they can pull a couple of levers, purge all the water from the powerhead, yank the starter cord, and be operational. The fuel flexibility is equally impressive. A simple mechanical switch retunes the engine for different fuel types. Why does this matter? Well, imagine you're operating from a Navy destroyer that only carries JP-5 jet fuel, or you're in a forward operating base in Afghanistan where the only fuel available is whatever the Army helicopters are using. These engines don't care. They'll burn it all. Now here's something that'll make environmentalists squirm. Raider got a special national security exemption from the EPA to build these engines. That's right, they're legally allowed to violate a mission standard that would land any recreational manufacturer in hot water. The military argued successfully that soldier safety trumps environmental concerns in combat situations. George Woodruff put it bluntly in an interview. Let's make something for the soldier to do his mission, get home, and forget high technology. His philosophy? When you're getting shot at, you don't want to be troubleshooting error codes on a digital display. 
While Rada dominates the traditional gas multi-fuel market, there's a fascinating revolution happening in military marine propulsion diesel outboards. Two companies, Cox Marine from the UK and OXC Marine from Sweden, are changing the game entirely. Cox Marine's CXO300 is an engineering marvel. This isn't some converted automotive engine slapped onto a lower unit. It's a purpose-built marine diesel V8 that produces a staggering 1,052 newton meters of torque. To put that into perspective, that's more pulling power than many pickup trucks. Naval commanders love these because diesel fuel is significantly safer to store on ships than gasoline. Remember, gasoline vapors can turn a confined space into a bomb, while diesel is about as flammable as cooking oil. OXE Marine takes a different approach with their OXE 300, using a BMW automotive engine mounted horizontally with an innovative belt drive system that eliminates traditional bevel gears. The result? Up to 42% better fuel economy than equivalent gas outboards, according to their testing. For long-range patrol boats operating hundreds of miles from base, that efficiency translates directly into mission capability. Here's where it gets interesting from a taxpayer perspective. These diesel outboards cost anywhere from $30,000 to $50,000 each. Your tax dollars at work, folks. But before you get your pitchforks out, consider this. A patrol boat that can stay on station 60% longer without refueling might mean the difference between intercepting drug smugglers or watching them slip away. Now let's talk about something the manufacturers don't want you to know. The dirty little secret of military outboard procurement is that it's often less about finding the absolute best engine and more about navigating the Byzantine world of government contracts. Raider Outboards, for instance, received a $2.5 million initial development contract in 2009 when they first heard SOCOM was looking for a multi-fuel solution. By 2022, they had over 1,600 engines fielded with various branches. Do the math. That's serious money for what are essentially modified commercial engines. Some critics argue that the Pentagon is overpaying for technology that hasn't fundamentally changed since the Vietnam War. But here's the counter-argument that nobody talks about. Dependability in extreme conditions is priceless. When a Guardian Angel pararescue jumper is pulling wounded soldiers out of hostile waters, or when maritime commandos are infiltrating enemy territory, engine failure isn't just inconvenient, it's potentially fatal. The omnivorous fuel consumption alone justifies much of the cost. During Hurricane Harvey, search and rescue teams using radar engines could refuel from any available source. Marine gas pumps, airport fuel trucks, even siphoning diesel from abandoned vehicles. Try doing that with your Mercury Verado. Quick reminder, if you want to see more deep dives into military technology that civilians rarely hear about, smash that like button. It really helps the channel, and I've got some incredible content coming up you won't want to miss. Here's where things get really interesting for us regular folks. The technology developed for military applications usually trickles down to the civilian market, just not in the way you'd expect. While you can't buy a radar engine, they're restricted to military and government sales only, the lessons learned from their simplicity-first approach are influencing commercial manufacturers. Some companies are now offering commercial-grade versions of their engines, with fewer electronic components and more mechanical redundancy. The diesel outboard revolution, however, is very much available to civilians. Both Cox and OXC sell to the commercial market, though you'd better have deep pockets. These engines are finding homes on yacht tenders, commercial fishing fleets, and patrol boats for private security companies. The real question is, do you need this level of capability? For 99% of recreational boaters, absolutely not. Your computer-controlled, fuel-injected four-stroke is perfect for weekend fishing trips and water skiing, but for that 1% operating in extreme conditions, Alaskan crab fishermen, offshore oil rig tenders, expedition vessels, these military-grade technologies offer capabilities that simply don't exist in the recreational market. Let's talk numbers that might blow your mind. A commercial fishing operation in Alaska recently switched their entire fleet to OXC diesels. Initial investment? $180,000 for six engines. Sounds insane, right? But here's the kicker. They're saving $150,000 per year in fuel costs alone. 
with a diesel burning 42% less fuel than comparable gas outboards, and these guys running 3,000 hours per season, the math actually works. Plus, diesel fuel is often 20 to 30% cheaper than marine gas in remote locations. The service interval difference is staggering, too. These diesel workhorses can run 500 hours between major services for a charter fishing operation running 250 days a year. That's the difference between five service appointments and one. Time is money, especially when your boat is your business. Here's something fascinating. Mercury Marine recently launched their Sea Pro commercial line, which strips away touchscreens and electronic throttles in favor of mechanical controls. Sound familiar, but industry insiders say they're directly responding to feedback from operators who've seen military spec simplicity in action. Yamaha followed suit with their High Thrust series, emphasizing mechanical reliability over electronic sophistication. The insurance implications are huge, too. Marine insurance companies are starting to offer 15 to 20 percent premium discounts for commercial vessels running diesel outboards. Why? Simple math. Diesel engines have 40% fewer moving parts than four-stroke gas engines, and no ignition system to fail. One insurance adjuster told me they've seen 60% fewer claims on diesel-powered commercial vessels. That's real money in your pocket if you're running a maritime business. Looking forward, the landscape of military outboard procurement is evolving rapidly. There's serious talk about hybrid diesel electric systems that would allow a completely silent operation for stealth insertions. Imagine a reconnaissance team approaching an enemy position with zero engine noise, just the sound of water lapping against the hull. Raider themselves are developing a 65-horsepower hybrid that can switch between electric and fossil fuel power. The electric mode would be perfect for navigating minefields where traditional engines might trigger acoustic mines. This isn't science fiction. Prototypes are already undergoing field testing after initial development began in 2024. The NATO Single Fuel Directive is also driving innovation. The Alliance wants all military vehicles, from tanks to patrol boats, running on a unified fuel type to simplify logistics. This means more pressure to develop engines that can efficiently burn JP-8 jet fuel, which combusts very differently from gasoline. There's also a push for increased power without added weight. Combat units want engines that can plane heavy armored boats loaded with weapons and gear, but still be light enough for two operators to carry. It's a tall order that's driving some genuinely innovative engineering solutions. The numbers behind this future are mind-boggling. The Department of Defense has allocated $450 million for small boat propulsion research through 2028. That's not buying engines, that's just R&D money. The focus? Something called adaptive combustion technology that would allow a single engine to automatically optimize its combustion chamber for whatever fuel you pour in. No manual switching required. MIT's Sea Grant program is working on this with a prototype that can detect fuel type using infrared spectroscopy and adjust compression ratios on the fly using variable valve timing borrowed from Formula One technology. Here's where it gets wild. DARPA is funding research into what they call bioadaptive outboards that can literally run on algae-based fuels grown in portable bioreactors. Imagine a forward operating base growing its own fuel in what looks like a shipping container. They're targeting 100 gallons of usable fuel per day from a single 20-foot container. Initial tests show 35% efficiency. Not great, but when you're 500 miles from the nearest fuel depot, it's better than walking. The weight problem is seeing radical solutions, too. Lockheed Martin is experimenting with ceramic engine blocks that weigh 40% less than aluminium but can handle twice the pressure. Combined with carbon fiber connecting rods and titanium valves, They've built a 100-horsepower prototype that weighs just 145 pounds. For context, current 100-horsepower outboards weigh around 400 pounds. The catch? Each engine costs $125,000 to produce, but the military is interested. Very interested. Electric propulsion is advancing faster than most people realize. The Navy's newest requirement calls for two hours of silent running at 20 knots on battery power alone. Current lithium technology can't deliver that without adding 800 pounds of batteries, but solid-state batteries, expected by 2027, could cut that weight in half while doubling the range. Raytheon is already testing boats with swappable battery packs that can be charged from a destroyer's power grid in under 30 minutes. 
So why does the US Navy always use engines by this company? Well, the truth is they don't stick to just one. They've evolved from Evinrude's decades of dominance to a new era where Raider provides the multi-fuel workhorses, while Cox and OXC deliver diesel power for different mission profiles. What ties all these manufacturers together is a philosophy completely opposite from the recreational market. While your local dealer is pushing the latest touchscreen equipped, smartphone integrated, whisper quiet four stroke, the military is buying deliberately simple, overbuilt engines that prioritize reliability over everything else. Is it controversial that these engines get EPA exemptions? Absolutely. Is it wasteful that taxpayers are funding $20,000 plus outboards that use technology from the 1980s? Maybe. But when American service members are operating in harm's way, whether rescuing flood victims in Houston or conducting midnight raids in hostile waters, having an engine that starts every time isn't just important, it's everything. The next time you're at the boat ramp, cursing because your high-tech outboard is throwing another error code, remember that somewhere out there, a special forces operator is pulse-starting a deliberately primitive engine that just spent three hours underwater, running on whatever fuel they could scrounge, and trusting it with their life. And it's working. If you made it this far, you're clearly as fascinated by this stuff as I am. Hit that subscribe button and join our community of people who love diving deep into the technologies and stories that shape our world. Ring the notification bell so you don't miss our next video, where we're going to explore the classified world of special operations watercraft. Trust me, some of these boats make James Bond's equipment look like toys. Drop a comment below about what surprised you most in this video. Was it the $21,000 price tag for a pull start engine, the fact that they can run on whiskey, or that the Navy is still essentially using technology from your grandpa's era? And hey, if you know any veterans who've actually used these engines in the field, tag them. I'd love to hear their stories. Until next time, keep your powder dry and your engine simple. Peace out.